In this lecture, we'll be discussing theories of reinforcement. So what exactly do we think is going on behind the scenes when the process of reinforcement is taking place? And there are several different theories about this. The first one we'll discuss is the drive reduction theory. And this theory was developed by Clark Hull. If you remember from chapter one, when we discussed the five schools of behaviorism, Clark Hull believed that there are intervening variables that come between the stimulus in the environment and the behavioral response. And Hull hypothesized these intervening variables to be physiological factors. So for example, if the stimulus is a hamburger and the behavior is eating the hamburger, Hull would say that the intervening variable of hunger comes between those two. So the person sees a hamburger, they experience hunger, and at least their behavior of eating the hamburger. So this is the same theorist that came up with that theory. And so according to the drive reduction theory, an event is reinforcing to the extent that it is associated with the reduction of a physiological drive. So he would say that a hamburger is reinforcing because it reduces the hunger drive. Money is reinforcing because it can buy you food, which then satisfies or reduces that, that hunger drive. So Hull believes that every reinforcer can be associated with some um, reduction in a physiological drive. So wearing a certain brand of clothing might be reinforcing to you because it attracts a mate who can reduce the drive for sex. Or getting good grades is reinforcing because getting good grades will get you a good job that will earn you money, that will allow you to buy a comfortable home or a place to rest to satisfy that need for, for resting relaxation. So everything through some process can be tied back to reducing a physiological drive. But some reinforcers do not seem to be associated with drive reduction. Your book points out examples like attending a concert. How is that reinforcing? How does that lead to some reduction of a drive? Playing a video game. So some reinforcers do not seem to be able to be associated with reducing any type of physiological drive. These reinforcers tend to rely more on incentive motivation. So this is motivation that is derived from some property of the reinforcer as opposed to an internal drive state. Something about the reinforcer in and of itself is what causes that reinforcement effect. And this is very similar to the idea of intrinsic reinforcement we talked about last week. So just purely engaging in the activity is what's reinforcing. You attend a concert not because it helps reduce some type of drive, you just enjoy the activity for the activity's sake. So because of this, jurors no longer believe that drive reduction can offer a comprehensive explanation of reinforcement. Not every type of reinforcement can be explained through this particular theory. And so while the drive reduction theory um, causes us to have to rely on hypothesizing about internal states, we can't see a hunger drive being reduced. We can't see um, a drive for rest being reduced. We have to you know, hypothesize or make inferences about those internal states. But the pre-MAC principle, um, in contrast, allows us to rely simply on observable behavior rather than those internal states that we cannot actually observe. So the pre principle allows us an objective way to determine what can be used as a reinforcer. If you think back to Skinner's definition of a reinforcer, he said a reinforcer is anything that increases or strengthens a behavior. But based on that definition, we have to have a behavior Follow it by something that we believe might be a reinforcer, but we don't know whether that is actually a reinforcer until we see the effect on behavior. We don't know if something is a reinforcer until we see whether or not it increased or strengthened the behavior. But the pre mac principle allows us to determine ahead of time what is likely to be a reinforcer. So rather than having to experiment, use a reinforcer and see if it is in fact a reinforcer, we can determine or using it whether or not it's likely to increase or strengthen the behavior. And so the pre mac principle says that a high probability behavior can be used to reinforce a low probability behavior. And what this means is you have to observe an organism or observe a person in action. 
They're allowed to go about their own devices, do whatever they want to. What activities do they engage in? So you look at what they choose to do, and you can use the activities that they are likely to, or they do choose to engage in, to reinforce behaviors that they don't choose to engage in. So if you were to um, you know, observe your child, and your child chose to spend hours a day watching TV, but only a short period of time doing their homework, you know that you can use watching TV as a reinforcer for doing their homework. So if you do your homework, then I will allow you to watch TV. If your child spends, um, like to eat lots of candy and very little broccoli, then you can say, if you eat your broccoli, I will allow you to eat some candy. So use that high probability behavior as a reinforcer for the low probability behavior. So this you know, goes back to the old adage, first you work and you play. Do the thing that you don't really want to do, and then your reward or your reinforcer is you get to do the thing that you really like to do. So according to this theory, reinforcers are behaviors rather than stimuli. So it's engaging in the behavior that's reinforcing, not the particular stimulus. So the pre math principle would say that the reinforcer is not candy, it's not the actual stimulus, it's eating candy. It's the behavior that's a reinforcer. Now, the pre math principle requires you to know the frequencies of two behaviors before you can judge if one can serve as a reinforcer for another. So the pre math principle um, requires you to know the frequency of the high probability behavior and the low probability behavior before you can determine you know, which one will be a reinforcer. The response deprivation hypothesis allows you to turn a behavior into a reinforcer. So if you know the frequency of one behavior, you can make that behavior into a reinforcer. So this hypothesis says that a behavior can serve as a reinforcer when one Access to that behavior is restricted, and two, its frequency falls below its preferred level of occurrence. Okay, so to explain this further, let's say your child, again, left to its own devices, would spend four hours a day watching TV. Your child can watch TV as long as they want to any given day, and they choose to spend about four hours a day watching TV. You can turn watching TV into a reinforcer by one, restricting their access to that behavior. So if you know that they like watching TV four hours a day, you deprive them of TV, you put them into a state of deprivation until their TV watching falls below the preferred frequency. So if you restrict them from TV until they're watching less than four hours a day of TV, you can then use watching TV as a reinforcer to reinforce another behavior. So think about this. If you want to reinforce your child's behavior by giving them candy, you can't allow them unrestricted access to candy and then say, I'm going to give you candy as a reinforcer because they've already you know, satisfied their desire for candy. If you put them into a state of deprivation by denying them candy, restricting their access to candy, until their candy consumption has fallen below their preferred level, then you can use candy as a reinforcer. Again, deprive them of what they would choose to do, and then you can use that stimulus or that behavior as a reinforcer. And the final theory of reinforcement that we'll discuss is the behavioral blank approach. So like the response deprivation hypothesis, this approach assumes that there is an optimal level of behavior that an organism strives to maintain. So there is a certain balance of various activities that we would choose to engage in. So an organism with free access to alternative activities will distribute his behavior in such a way as to maximize overall reinforcement. So when a person or organism is left to their own devices, they're going to distribute their time in a way as to give the maximum level of reinforcement out of how they spend their time. But when activities are not freely available, as when the two activities are intertwined in the contingency of reinforcement, we have to do these there. So uh, when 
activities are not freely available as when the two activities are intertwined and in the contingency of reinforcement, the optimal distribution may not be attainable. So this would be like, let's say that you could spend your time however you want to. And you would say that on any given day, I would spend three hours at the spa getting massages and facials and different types of, of beauty and relaxation treatment. But um, three hours at the spa might cost you, let's say, $150. If you only make $15 an hour, you would have to work 10 hours in order to afford that, that three hour time at the spa. So let's say you have, I don't know, 12 waking hours every day. If it takes you 10 hours of work in order to be able to afford three hours at the spa, you're not gonna be able to get your optimal three hours a day at the spa that you would like. Even though your optimal bliss point would include three hours every day at the spa, there's a contingency in place that says, hey, you have to work at least 10 hours to be able to afford those three hours. So you're not going to be able every day to reach that optimal bliss point of your three hours at the spa because you only have 12 waking hours in your day. So there's some type of contingency where you have to do one activity in order to be able to do the other activity. You're not always able to reach that optimal distribution um, to get you the maximum level of reinforcement. So when you can't reach that optimal level, organisms will distribute activities in a way as to get as close as possible to your bliss point. So you might have to you know, say, optimally, I'd like to spend three hours a day at the spa, but that requires me to do more work than I have in time to do in a given day. So I'm going to reduce my um, you're going to the spa every day to two hours, and that will you know, require fewer hours of work for me to get to that point. So you kind of negotiate and balance your optimal level of reinforcement based on the contingencies between various behaviors. So organisms attempt to distribute their behavior so as to maximize their overall reinforcement. 